I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I wanted to uh, speak to a question that came in uh, related to my initial opening riff uh, in response to Raja's question about what do I mean by the Big Bang universe? And that actually is a fairly deep question. So I want to speak to it briefly and then get into uh, a way of looking at and, and thinking about and practicing with the heart of, uh, really the heart of the Buddha's wisdom, I think, um, in a way I've never talked about before. So this will be, you know, in, in its way, fresh material. So for better or worse. Uh, with regard to the question about the Big Bang universe, let's see here. I want to pull it up and when it came in. Yes. So from Brandon, and I'll use your name unless you uh, chat me privately. Uh, Brandon writes at 57 minutes past the hour, is Big Bang universe a euphemism? The idea that everything is the result of causes and conditions, i.e. physics and the natural scientific processes, or? Okay. So this... This is actually a deep matter because it has to do with what, <laughs> right? I, I kind of think if we don't go through life going, what? <laughs> you know, we're not paying attention. So where we start is with experiences. There are experiences. Uh, if you doubt having experiences, that's an experience of doubting experiences. Undeniably, there is hearing, there is seeing, there is thinking, there is pain, there is pleasure. There are experiences. From these experiences, we that are intangible, experiences are intangible, right? Can you weigh a, an emotion? Experiences are intangible, but from them, we infer a tangible world that we are seeing a tangible tree. There is actually a tree there. Uh, we are seeing hands. There actually are hands there. Uh, yes, I get the philosophy of, we don't know if we're absolutely sure we could all be like a dream made up by some astral being while smoking a joint in college, who knows? But most of us, me included, consider that when you stub your toe to kind of respond to the you know rebuttal to Bishop Barclay a couple hundred years ago, when you stub your toe on a rock, it's because there really is a rock there. There really is stuff. Now, with scientific knowledge that's been growing over the last 2,000 years, uh, paralleled remarkably by a lot of indigenous wisdom that had its own formulations that have you know also were, were really a way of understanding uh, the universe that we're in, we've really come to appreciate that we live in a universe that at one end of the size scale has galaxies and clusters of galaxies and the universe altogether, time scale, you know, a universe that apparently bubbled into being about 13.8 billion years ago, uh, and down to a, a really tiny, tiny scales of of distance and time, we start to recognize that there are molecules, there are cells in the body, there are little wiggly creatures that you can see under a microscope, and those little creatures are made of smaller structures, like you know the mitochondria in a cell, and then even smaller, we have molecules like DNA, and then even smaller, we have atoms, and then particles, and quantum foam. Uh, and things happening on a time scale of you know billionths of a billionth of a second. That's matter, broadly stated. So there is mind, there are experiences related to that, there is information, information is also intangible, and there is tangible stuff, which seems to be the necessary requirement, as far as we know so far, for uh, representing information or enabling, you know, creatures like us or lizards, mouse and mice and monkeys to have experiences. So when I refer to the Big Bang universe, I'm referring to the totality of the conditioned 
unfolding natural universe that so far, uh, the more and more deeply we investigate it, uh, has not needed uh, a resort to supernatural forces or ultimately transcendental forces to, ac to account for its unfolding. You don't need God to explain the movement of the planets around the sun. You don't need God to explain natural selection and the processes of evolution. All right. Now, ultimately, is there more than the Big Bang? That's the question in the Big Bang universe, right? And that's a deep question. I think many people swerve away from facing it, but it's a profound question. And I'm not arguing for a right answer. Um, I have my own approach. <clears throat> but the question has validity and deep import, I think, because uh, any answer is remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> if there's just the Big Bang, the un clockwork unfolding as a series of dominoes deterministically of the university, and when you're dead, you're dead, and that's that, whoa, that's pretty intense. Take that into account. Alternately, if um, you know the Big Bang universe is occurring in s some meaningful way, um, distinct from a kind of absolute, timeless, unconditioned ground that may also be aware and benevolent. Whoa! <laughs> that too <laughs> is pretty heavy duty, right? Um, and if uh, the answer is unknowable, that too is like, wow, wow, I can't, we can't even know. So I think it's uh, actually valuable in practice to face these questions squarely and to not play word games, as some do, to kind of try to evade them. Um, okay, so that's what I mean by Big Bang Universe, and that's the context for what I meant there. Now, the Buddha, <clears throat> to now transition to the subject of my talk here, the Buddha, um, and by the way, let me go back. The Big Bang Universe, uh, we're still learning a ton about it, it's kind of wild to appreciate that in my lifetime, uh, I was born in 1952, I think in my lifetime, in the, very, in the early 50s, um, an astronomer whose name will come to me in a moment uh, made the discovery that there were other galaxies besides our own. And then in fact, the universe is big and it's expanding. And now we understand there are roughly two trillion galaxies. A typical galaxy like ours has about 100 billion stars, in which more and more we're learning that there are probably millions, potentially, of small rocky planets like our own in which uh, liquid water can uh, occur on the surface. Whoa! It's a really big universe out there. We're learning all kinds of stuff. 95% uh, of the universe was unknown for the first third or more of my own lifespan. And, and it took the discovery of dark matter uh, and then dark energy to account for the 95% of the universe that is constituted by dark matter and dark energy. The ordinary stuff, thunk thunk, uh, is only about 5% of the total makeup of the Big Bang universe. Whoa, 95% <laughs> was unknown when I was like watching Star Trek as a kid, <laughs> right? So there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. But, uh, so, but that's what I'm referring to when I'm referring to the extraordinary and still um, caused by various conditions that are unfolding uh, natural Big Bang universe. Okay, so most of what the Buddha has talked about is inside the frame of the Big Bang universe, the natural unfolding. Um, he matter-of-factly referred to supernatural processes and, and matters, and such as devas and spirit beings and reincarnation and cosmological realms. But for him, that wasn't really central to, uh, to practice, and it wasn't central to the, uh, the causes of suffering, uh, which he dedicated his life to liberating himself and others from. Um, so uh, I, and yet ultimately, in my understanding of the surviving written record of his teachings in the canon, the Pali canon, Pali, a, a key language of early Buddhism, um, I think he was ultimately going beyond conditioned, deterministic, unfolding um, natural phenomena. But I'm going to speak 
here, mainly inside that frame. Okay, so here we go. Uh, a common model that is used in healthcare and psychology uh, was originally described as the stress diathesis model, the notion that challenges wear on vulnerabilities of various kinds. And then over time, there's been more and more of a focus, and it's been a primary focus for me, of the resources that we draw upon to deal with challenges and to protect and shore up and gradually even change vulnerabilities. So a way of understanding your course through life or anyone's course through life, and you can apply this as well to uh, other living things, uh, as well as to enterprises like a, um, a company or an organization or a country or even a species altogether. Challenges, vulnerabilities, and resources. Uh, as a clinician, routinely people walk into my office when I was still seeing people, uh, uh, and uh, typically they were facing challenges and vulnerabilities uh, that were wearing on them, and they were under-resourced. So one of the really important things to do over time, obviously, is to try to reduce challenges and protect vulnerabilities, but often we have fairly limited options there. Still, the building of resources um, is something that's routinely available to us. Uh, we can find challenges, vulnerabilities, and resources in three major places, out in the world, in the physical body, and in the mind. And if you combine challenges, vulnerabilities, and resources with their locations, out in the world, in the body, and in the mind, that gives you a three by three matrix with nine ways to make things better. This is a very useful summary, analytic, diagnostic way of thinking about things and looking for where's the low hanging fruit? You know, uh, what could we start doing now that could actually make a big difference here? So now I'd like to talk about Buddha Dharma inside that frame of challenges, vulnerabilities, and resources. And then in particular, talk about three kinds of resources that in my view are really at the heart of Buddhist practice and much of the detail of Buddhist practice found in various places, uh, including in the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, will uh, fit in to these three things that I'm gonna be talking about here. Okay. So, what's the challenge? Now, there are many challenges that create suffering or that wear on well-being, happiness, fulfillment. Poverty is a challenge that wears on uh, well-being. Uh, global heating, I think we've gone well beyond warming. We are in the land of global heating, uh, wears on well-being. Uh, you know, obnoxious people next door who yell at you when you get in your car, I do not have neighbors like that, I'm happy to say. That's a challenge. Illness is a challenge. Uh, these are challenges, right? Now, many challenges are tractable. We can do something about them if we have the will and the capacity and sometimes the good fortune. The Buddha was interested in his first ennobling truth his first truth for the noble ones who are practicing with these truths and their, their practice ennobles them. Um, the intractable challenge of what he called dukkha. Dukkha is a word from Pali, D-U-K-K-H-A in its usual English spelling. The intractable, inescapable, unavoidable challenge of dukkha. What is dukkha? Dukkha has three aspects to it. In our life, we must face dukkha. There is more to living than dukkha, but dukkha is an inescapable, unavoidable challenge in, for all living beings. Its three aspects are, first, there are unpleasant experiences certainly for organisms that have the capacity to experience pain. I'm not sure 
some single-celled protozoan, let alone a bacteria or a virus, can experience pain. But certainly, creatures that have a nervous system can, certainly at least a sophisticated nervous system, uh, can experience unpleasant experiences. There is pain sometimes. That's an unavoidable aspect of life. That's a challenge. And sometimes the pain is subtle. Sometimes it's horrible. Sometimes it's passing. Sometimes it's chronic. There, there is pain. Second aspect of dukkha is that all of our good experiences change eventually into something else and often end altogether. Uh, all pleasant experiences end eventually. That's the second aspect of dukkha. That's a fact, isn't it? That's a fact. All that is subject to arising is subject to passing away, uh, if only in the eventual death of this body. Third aspect of dukkha is a little more subtle, but in a way much more profound and consequential and all-pervading. It's the observation that certainly all of our experiences, you know, the mind process, consciousness, the streaming of consciousness, all of that certainly, and arguably most if not all, of the material phenomena of our universe, which includes energy, because matter squared times the matter times the speed of light squared equals energy. You know, they're, they're the same kind of tissue ultimately. Okay. Um, all phenomena have the nature to be impermanent, made of parts, compounded, and occurring interdependently, so that no experience has any kind of absolute self-existence or absolute identity or absolute essence, and therefore is incapable of being permanently grasped. Experiences are ineffable. They're insubstantial. They're changing. They're cloud-like. Someone asked me in the chat, what did I mean that it can be useful to look at tasks as more like clouds than bricks? It's the same orientation, the, the doing of the task the, including actually the physical objects that are involved in the task, the pieces of paper, the shovels of dirt, the dishes in the sink, all of those have the nature described in the third aspect of dukkha of emptiness, to use the technical term. They are empty of solidity. They exist, they exist emptily. These are these three qualities of dukkha. And because of these three qualities, and particularly the last one, um, it's impossible to hold on to fleeting experiences. We must let them go continuously. And trying to hold on to them is, is problematic. Okay, so we have the challenge of dukkha in the framework of the stress diathesis model combined with resources. What's the vulnerability that dukkha wears upon? The vulnerability is in the second ennobling truth, our vulnerability to tanha, T-A-N-H-A in Pali. Pali is spelled P-A-L-I, uh, tanha. Tanha is routinely translated, I think quite well, as craving. Uh, technically, craving is sometimes distinguished from other things such as clinging or problematic attachment uh, but it's this whole territory that I think craving whose root for the word tanha in Pali is thirst. Something is missing. Something is wrong. We got to have something different happen. That's our vulnerability. And we evolved to crave. Animals back in the day, you know, a thousand years ago, human animals, a million years ago, a hundred million years ago, animals that did not have systems and a whole architecture of drivenness to react to what's unpleasant by you know, fleeing from it or freezing in the face of it or if necessary, fighting with it. Animals that did not crave to continue living one more breath one more second or minute, they were less likely to survive and pass on genes that passed on genes. Animals that did not particularly care about getting fed or finding shelter or evading predators or protecting their children 
or as the social brain evolved over the last couple of three million years, animals that, you know, hominins and early humans and modern humans that did not care about forming alliances with the group and did not care about their reputation and did not care about impressing others and wanting their reputation to be good and, you know, did not in some ways, you know, crave love. Poof. Those folks were less likely to, you know, make their contribution to the gene pool and have their characteristics woven into the fabric of our DNA today. All right? So craving is our vulnerability. Craving is our vulnerability. It's not our fault we crave, right? So the Buddha, in his incredible clarity, the fruit of his own practice, recognized the challenge, the intractable challenge of dukkha. Now to be clear, dukkha itself is not suffering. It's routinely, commonly, you'll find it everywhere in Western Buddhism, and including what's been handed to us uh, from the you know, Theravadan tradition in Southeast Asia. Uh, du dukkha is routinely regarded as uh, suffering. Dukkha itself is not suffering. Yes, there is pain in that one of three aspects of dukkha, uh, but we need not suffer it, okay? And, um, it's also said sometimes that dukkha means that all experiences are unsatisfactory. Well, why are they unsatisfactory? Because they're impermanent. Well, why is an impermanent experience unsatisfactory if we don't crave it, if we don't cling to it and essentialize it and identify with it and try to hold on to it? In other words, dukkha alone is not suffering. And in fact, all those impermanent experiences that are passing away are actually endlessly replaced by the arising gift of the next moment of reality, including the experiencing, you know, in our own place. You know? Dukkha is not inherently unsatisfactory. And actually, when you start to understand uh, that the Buddha was speaking to an extraordinary opportunity, that we can be with dukkha without tanha, you start to appreciate the radical good news in his teaching. Dukkha plus tanha equals suffering. Dukkha without tanha is resilience, equanimity, inner peace, spaciousness. Aliveness is uh, while time streams through your awareness. So, given the challenge of dukkha, and the vulnerability of tanha, of craving, um, what are the resources that we can bring to bear to live our life courageously and happily with love and virtue and wisdom? What are the resources that can help us deal with the challenge of dukkha and the vulnerability of tanha, of craving? So I'm going to pause just for a second here, or a few seconds, for you to kind of reflect in your own life. Huh. Dukkha in your life. Things are impermanent. They're constantly changing. There's an instability in living. Pleasant experiences end. There is difficulty. There is pain. How do you deal with it? And what are the ways in which craving has sunk its, its hooks into you, including in subtle ways, forms of drivenness, insistence, emotional reactivity, uh, relating things to yourself, taking things very personally, trying to get blood from a stone, trying to grow roses in a parking lot, So what are we going to do? So here I want to talk about three resources that I think are right at the heart of Buddhist practice. And also, Buddhist practice has no monopoly on them. We can find them elsewhere in other traditions. So the first of the three, and I'm sure there are four or 10 or 20, but I'm going to focus on three that I think en encompass many, many things. The first one I'll call find heart. 
here you are. Um, somebody wrote me earlier today about losing their sight. Incredibly upsetting. Uh, I know people who are grappling with terminal um, cancer. Uh, I know people who've uh, lost ones they loved. I know people who've lost loved ones and they had some responsibility for that loss. Wow. I mean, wow. Uh, societally, we're facing very serious problems um, with what seems like a complete lack of coming to grips with it at um, the international and national level that's sufficient to actually deal with things like, you know, systemic injustice, poverty, and and global heating. Wow. Well, first is to find heart. Find your own heart. You know, the Buddha really emphasized the heart. Some of the later interpretations of his teachings highlight very technical, analytic uh, deconstructions of the stream of consciousness, but really central to practice is heart. The heart of feeling in community with others who are suffering or dealing with hard things. Humanity, you know, you're dealing with a problem. Um, can you connect with others about it? Uh, can you tell appropriate people? Uh, can you um, find your own lovingness, your own compassion for yourself? Can you know that you have a good heart? You have fundamentally good intentions toward others, even if you don't express them perfectly, um, find heart. Never underestimate the, the heart. Come home to the heart, be aware of your heart, return to your heart, slow things down so you can have time for heart, um, if only for a few seconds before you speak, you know, find heart. Uh, there's a famous passage, you may know it, in which the Buddha's uh, cousin, Ananda, his primary attendant, and someone with apparently an extraordinary memory. So when you read suttas and it starts out, thus have I heard, that's the voice of Ananda coming down to us, reciting what he heard uh, from the Buddha. And Ananda was with the Buddha one time when they were gathered in a community of uh, monks, male monastics at that time. And Ananda you know, rejoiced in the gathering there and said, Look, noble sir, this is half of the holy life, the other half being implicitly, I believe, internal practice, as it were. And the Buddha replied, not so, Ananda, not so. This is the whole of the holy life, practicing in community with others. Heart. Uh, the heart of, uh, you know, three of the four uh, immeasurables of, uh, you know, compassion, kindness, uh, joyfulness uh, for the welfare of others, along with equanimity. Find heart. First and foremost, you know, come home to the heart, live from the heart, be lived by the heart, find heart. That covers so much ground. Okay. Second, don't throw second darts. And this has to do with the distinction between pain and suffering. Uh, when we're faced with difficulty, it is what it is. Drop a brick on your foot, you know, read the headlines about yet one more superstorm because the ocean temperatures are rising uh, due to global heating. Uh, you know, somebody is irritating with toward you, you get a disappointment in your in in some project or business. That's the first dart of life. The inescapable inherent discomfort from subtle to, to horrible, physical and mental. Second darts are what we add to it. Taking it personally, getting angry about feeling hurt, getting angry about feeling anxious, um, getting annoyed with other people who dare to disagree with us. Uh, these are the darts we throw ourselves. This is the secondary cascade of reactivity. And um, <clears throat> over time, we get quicker and quicker in recognizing that we've been throwing darts for a while. Quicker meaning like, oh, it 
I've, really, I've been throwing darts for a few years. Then you start to realize a few months, a few weeks, a few days, a few hours, a few minutes. When you start getting close to within seconds of recognizing you've been you know, getting revved up with second dart reactivity, then you're getting closer and closer uh, to no darts. And then over time, uh, phenomena occur that are really unpleasant. That's a first dart. And there's no second dart added to it. Uh, you could be in situations where something is really p unpleasant or painful, but it does not invade your mind and remain, as the Buddha put it. You know, it's painful, but it doesn't bother you. Or it's, it's occurring, and even if the bothering is occurring, it's at the periphery of the core of your being. And the core of your being is stably intact and rested in um, a kind of resilient peacefulness contentment and love, around which could well be uh, first darts of outrage at injustice, perhaps also even second darts of getting revved up about that outrage. But in the core of your being over time is a growing stillness and um, unconditional well-being and, and inner wisdom that's intact and undisturbable, unshakable over time. So that's the second major resource, is the training of the mind, uh, whether it's through psychotherapy or self-help, uh, different paths or Buddhist practice itself. There's the training of the mind uh, in, in which we get more, we get closer and closer to real time. Uh, that's one thing that presence really helps with, real time recognition of first darts occurring and the arising of second dart reactivity. And we get more and more in real time with regulating second dart reactivity so that it doesn't hijack us. It doesn't occupy us and sweep us away. That's fundamental practice, you know? And part of the fun of practice, and I'm, I'm in the practice with you, uh, is to look for subtler and subtler forms of second dart reactivity, you know, as you kind of Gradually, slowly, but surely, you know, uh, kind of get your mental house in order. Um, it gets more and more interesting, you know, to be able to be present with things as they are, including things that are un really unpleasant, uh, without um, adding insult to injury, without adding suffering to, uh, to pain. Okay? And then the third great practice is to be in the present. Now, it's easy to take this as some kind of hackneyed cliche. Be present. Be here now. Well, be here now is extraordinary to sustain being here now. And Ram Dass's, bless his memory, um, wisdom about this was quite extraordinary, of course. Um, being in the present, I want to unpack this in three ways. The first is to, you know, Reflect on the past as it is productive, but not past the point that's useful, and gradually disrupt rumination about re mistakes, regrets, and remorse. That's a practice. That's a practice. And I gave a talk in this Wednesday meditation, uh, I don't know, maybe six months ago, I forget. It's been a blur. Um, uh, about mistakes, regret, and remorse. You might want to go back and take a look at that. So we, we come increasingly out of the past. We harvest wisdom from the past as it is useful, but increasingly rest in the present. And we think about the future. We plan the future. We try on different possibilities. We do affective forecasting, as it's called, skillfully. But enough is enough. We don't just dwell endlessly in fantasizing about the future and worrying about it and planning for it. And we start increasingly disengaging from the machinery of becoming which is very deep in us. The, the brain is a prediction machine, an expectation generator, matching um, current um, perceptions uh, against previous expectations for learning purposes and guiding skillful behavior. There's a lot about that that's useful, but there's so much about becoming that could just take on a life of its own. And the Buddha called out attachment to becoming as, as a major source of suffering as a major subtle expression of tanha, and the alternative is to increasingly release the machinery of becoming and rest instead in being, 
in which doing can occur and planning can occur in the context, in the ground of what feels like being. This is a development over time, but it's useful to understand what we're developing. So this is the first kind of gross, profound, but still fairly gross benefit of uh, being in the present, coming into now, resting in now. Okay. A second benefit in resting in the present goes back to the misunderstanding of dukkha as speaking to an inherent unsatisfactoriness in living that has to do with the fact that, yes, all phenomena are changing instantaneously. Right? Some have more stability, but even in their stability, there's a, there's a dynamism, a complexity, a vibrational complexity in that experience. At, at bottom, the representational machinery of your own brain, in terms of the neural substrates of consciousness, has a dynamism at the cellular level, at the molecular level, at the underlying quantum level um, that's inescapable. So there is a, a fizzing turbulence inherent in, in the unfolding of the Big Bang universe, including those aspects of it that underlie the unfolding of the streaming of consciousness instantaneously, continuously. Okay, it is ending, sure, but it's endlessly arising. We are being endlessly gifted with the extraordinary gift as arguably one aspect of a fundamental benevolence in ultimate reality, the extraordinary gifting of the arising of the next moment, which, you know, plausible theories of physics tell us have to do with the temporal expansion of the four-dimensional Big Bang universe, three dimensions of space, one of time. And so we are living in the creation endlessly of new time. We are being pulled into the future endlessly, necessarily leaving the present behind as we are gifted endlessly the next arising moment. And when you kind of, whoa, you know, move beyond conceptualization, which itself is trippy and cool, but whoa, you, you start to have a sense of like gobsmacked gratitude at the givingness, the giftedness of the ongoingness of your own existence. Whoa, you know, suffering and clinging to the present can fall away as you increasingly trust you know, the expansive giftedness of the, of the universe that you're continually falling, whoo, open out into. That's the second kind of deep benefit in really being present, getting very close to the emergent present of this moment. You start really living closer and closer and closer to the endless giftedness of the present moment. Buddha has a line, um, we think it was from the Buddha, who knows, maybe one of his followers, but it's in the Pali Canon, that those essentially who are wise, those who are far along in practice, they're complex, they are, they have let go of the past, they have let go of the future, and their complexions are serene. Serene. Then third and last, um, a very profound aspect of coming into the present oof, is that it starts bringing us experientially closer and closer and closer into perhaps that in which the present is emerging. The present being conditioned, okay? the result of past moments conditioning the present, okay, including our own streaming of consciousness. But as you move closer and closer to the present, you start potentially having more and more of an intimation of the unconditionality, unconditioned, timeless, ultimate, perhaps, ground in which conditioned phenomena are emerging endlessly and over time become, as I said, you know, in the kind of warm up to the uh, official event that starts at 6 p.m. on Pacific time, you become more and more 
rested as I believe um, people become far along in practice in both. It's kind of like the front of you is living in the unfolding present of conditioned phenomena in your own life, dealing with your own real stuff, while it's almost as if the back of you, it's a poor, it's not a, don't take it too literally, the back of you is rested in unconditionality and timelessness, the absolute peacefulness, perhaps with a sense of in some ways being lived by a kind of ultimate uh, mysterious, certainly, awareness and uh, benevolence. Okay, so we have challenges, then we have the challenge of dukkha, we have the vulnerability of tanha, that's the first and second noble truth. Uh, dukkha does not translate well, tanha translates pretty well as craving. And then we have the resources of finding heart, disengaging from the second darts that we throw ourselves, and coming into the present with its three increasingly profound benefits, which I think summarizes um, and encompasses a lot of practice. And may your own engagement with this um, be a great benefit to you, rippling outward from you, touching others far and wide in ways seen and unseen. Okay. So let's take a moment or so, or a few moments, just quietly together. How do you reflect on this for yourself? Right. The challenge of dukkha, you know, which includes the passing away of our own body. Dukkha includes old age, disease, and death. Huh. And then we have craving, you know, like the, the animal, the monkey of the body wants to hold on, you know. I have fallen off um, ledges and holds while rock climbing, and you know, I desperately tried to hold on until I couldn't. Tanha, and then practice. How do you practice with finding heart, disengaging from those second dart cascades, and coming into the present, including um, increasingly radically? I'm going to um, reply to a couple questions in the chat uh, fairly briefly, We're coming near the end. And I just want to clarify certain terms uh, that I kind of flew right through. Um, the first term where we hear noble ones. Uh, noble ones is just a term that's routinely found in um, the Pali Canon. Uh, it refers to those who have practiced deeply and the Buddha made an enormous, radical, revolutionary distinction of his time that the kind of nobility of the heart, the nobility of intention that he was referring to, the nobility of conduct, had nothing to do with the caste system of his time, nor anything fundamentally to do with gender either, both of uh, whose positions that he took, eventually he needed to be prodded on the gender one. Um, by his mother uh, and others, women, um, you know, that was very revolutionary at the time. So I'm using the term, these are typically described as the four noble truths. Technically, they're, they are truths for the noble ones. And I've taken some liberty with that to talk about, uh, you know, the ennobling nature of um, facing and practicing with the truth, the facts. There is, the, there is dukkha, it's a fact. There is craving, that's a fact too. There is the cessation of craving and the suffering, nirodha. And there is the fact as well of a path that works 
to become increasingly uh, resourced to deal with the challenge of dukkha with the vulnerability of craving. So um, that ennobles us. Uh, emptiness is simply a technical term that refers to the combination that all phenomena, or certainly most, all consciousness uh, phenomena, are made of parts that are connected and changing. Thus, empty or lacking. It's like a living room that is empty of furniture. You know, all phenomena are lacking um, absolute self-causing existence, absolute identity or essence or absolute um, capacity to be owned in an ultimate sense, including the sense of me, myself, and I. Me, myself, the sense of me, myself, and I occurs as an experience, like hearing occurs as an experience, sensations in your fingers occur as experiences, but all experiences occur emptily. And the presumption that there is a personal self who is solid, enduring, and independent is um, undermined to the point of great freedom by the recognition of the fundamental emptiness of the one we purport to be, emptiness. Okay? Great. All right. So let's finish there. Let's uh, just kind of be quiet together for a few breaths. The whole point is what lands inside you and what carries you along and what can you come home to, which for me are three different ways of saying the same thing. Can you be lived by the implications of what we've explored together here? 